So my name is Paul Cleary. I'm an engineer at Comcast. And today, my talk is called Scala for the Rest of Us. And this is a, uh, a talk about a transitioning from an OO mindset to more of a functional programming mindset in a way that you build software. So how many people here are kind of new to Scala, new to OO in general? All right, cool. So good. Um, so as part of this talk too, I'm hoping to maybe dispel a little bit about a little bit of the anxiety about coming to functional programming, right? So it's not this this daunting, right? It's not this long of a bridge, so to speak. Um, so we'll start with who are the rest of us? And I think, you know, I've been doing development now for a long time. I don't want to show my age, a very long time. Um, but you know, all the rest of us have been building systems using OO, and I don't think we have a um, practical experience or education in functional programming. Right? Um, there, there tends to be with an OO now, because it's been the predominant methodology, if you will, for the last 20 years, these kind of standard building blocks that we use to build systems. Right? It's almost like this ubiquitous language, which is actually pretty cool, because when you open up an OO system or, or a project and you're not familiar with it, you kind of can get around in the code pretty easily, right? You know, there's, if I see an adapter, I know what's going on there. If I see a decorator, I know what's going on there. And if I see a controller, I know what's happening, right? Um, but so the issue when you, I think that when you come to functional programming is that there's a whole new set of tools that you really don't know how to apply, right? They challenge our understanding about how to build systems. You know, functions are things, right? Like, they're not methods on classes, they're, they're something else. Um, carrying and partially applied functions and things like that. Um, and in addition to the newness of, of these things, you kind of get thrust immediately into like category theory, right? There's all these abstract concepts and ideas and terminology. I mean, how many people here have been like attended a talk or watched a video and at the end of it you're like, I, I don't know what just happened, right? <laughs> like, like there were words said, uh, I think it was English. Um, and, and unfortunately, like, this is the trap that we get in, right? Because you kind of feel left out coming from an OO standpoint. You feel left out of the conversation. So it, it's very compelling to just jump in and try to learn category theory overnight, right? So, but the problem is, is that every time you learn a new term, there's 20 more terms that you've never heard about before, right? And then for each one of those, there's 20 more terms, and it's a rabbit hole. And I, I kind of experienced this myself because I was trying to learn all these things and you get frustrated. It's like, all right, so how do I actually build systems using this, right? The theory is nice, but what's the practical application of these concepts in my day-to-day -day routine, right? Um, can anybody here tell me what a monoid and a semigroup have in common? They both join together. Yeah, they, they, they both have the, the binary operation. Yeah. But the, but the answer I'm actually looking for is neither one of them are necessary for, to do functional programming in Scala, right? <laughs> so, so the idea is that the hard thing is is that there's a lot of people running around peddling their dank category theory, right? And it's like really hard to resist the urge to kind of jump into that side of things, right? So if, if you don't need to know all that stuff to get started, if you don't need all, all that stuff to do functional programming in Scala, the question is, well, what do you need to know? Right, and you know the the next slide. Unfortunately, I I came across this like later in my my learning of of Scala, but there was a video by Runa Bjarnason. It was 2010, 2011. Uh, I think it was a Scala meetup, and he said functional programming is programming with functions. <laughs> right, it's simple, right? It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but he doesn't. Runar doesn't say functional programming is programming with applicatives, right, or isomorphisms. Right? It's programming with functions, and it, as an OO developer, and we're OO developers here, some of us at least, right? it means I can build systems using nothing more than this. Okay? So like, it's very, very simple. Um, and when you start building systems, and if you try to build a system, something that's more than a trivial uh, example of using this, you come into some of those other things, uh, like, like carrying and things like that. But beyond that, we kind of read, like, so this is Wikipedia, the, the, the Oracle All of Knowledge. Um, and it has this kind of long definition about what functional programming is, right? When you hear about things like referential transparency, and you hear purity, that a function is, a, is defined in terms of its input, right? Um, avoiding mutable state and avoiding side effects. But really what this means is being predictable, eliminating uncertainty in the way that you build software, okay? So I have this, the, the, this bulletproof guide that I think <laughs> that you can, this path to learning functional programming in Scala is, 
avoid being distracted by the category theory things, at least at first, right? Um, learn the basics. I mean, you have to learn Scala syntax, but the Scala syntax today, there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. 47 degrees is great. When I got started, I got Scala cones. Did everybody else here do Scala cones, right? Um, and then just look there, I believe that there are some fundamentals that you have to learn before you get started, okay? Um, and the last important point here is pretty important is that learn as you go. Don't try and tackle category theory and tackle all this abstract math up front. You know, discover it as you go. So the, these are the basics that I believe that you need to, to kind of tackle before you get into programming. And, and um, I didn't invent these, by the way. So if you look at the Coursera classes, if you look at the Red Book in the first chapters or uh, Essential Scala um, from the Underscore book, like these kind of are the first things they teach you. But the neat thing, the neat thing about all these things is that we can relate to these things as object-oriented developers. Okay. So I'll, I'll try and relate to some of these in the upcoming slides. Um, can you guys see this in the back? Okay. So, so the idea is prefer immutability. So we use vowels over vars in Scala. In Java, right, we prefer final. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is that we, we use immutable data structures, okay? So case classes. You know, these for uh, OO people, Java people, these are like Java beans without setters, right? They're more than that, but that's kind of the understanding. And once you start using these in your code, it kind of subtly influences the way that you write your code. Immutable collections. Uh, this is pre-Java 8 and without Guava, by the way, but like, I mean, we write code like to do filtering, and there's a lot of words in here. It's pretty verbose. And the first time you start doing, working with collections, and this was really enticed me about Scala, you know, uh, four years ago or so, is that uh, the bottom code is where I'm doing filtering. I'm get, given a list of people, I'm returning only those that are managers. But not only is it more concise, but it's extremely, um, you know, uh, easy to understand, right? It's very expressive. And now I'm using Lambda, so by the way, I'm doing functional programming, right? I'm using functions in my code. Uh, so, <laughs> This is pattern matching, Java old way. This is, uh, I have a function that given a pet returns a description of it uh, based off its type, right? So this is ugly, right? and this is only three cases, and I've written code like this, and generally you don't want to touch code like this, right? But once you get used to it, and you, you, you see the power of pattern matching, and you're using case class and immutable data structures and immutable types, it's very expressive, right? Like I can connect to this because I've worked with code like this but I can connect to how much better pattern matching is, okay? Um, handling nulls is another thing that you kind of, we work with, there's, there's standards around handling nulls. Right? So the problem with, in Java, where at least a lot of the systems that I've built, is that how do we know person is there? Right, so the, the, how you know it is that you either have to inspect all the code paths, right, to get to that point in the code to determine whether it's null or not, in order to do the check, or you have to live with squashing NPEs during your, you know, the execution of your runtime, which is a, an un, unsatisfying place to be, right? But, the, but within Scala, we use option. And this is, this is kind of where we use wrapper types to kind of like denote for certain characteristics about values. Here we're, making, we're bringing to the forefront the fact that this value might not be there. So you as a developer are forced to deal with it as opposed to guessing. We talk about uncertainty and, and making your code more predictable. Okay. Um, business errors. We, we handle these with checks exceptions. Does everybody love checked exceptions, right? The problem with Java is that exceptions are like, they're not returning a value, right? It's, it's a, an abnormal execution or return exit out of your code. Right? So it's hard to kind of like, so it's an abnormal exit. We throw a business error out and we hope that the caller of this code is going to manage it the right way. But they don't, right? Uh, we see that every single method in my system has throws exception on it, right? And it comes all the way up or else we squash it in uncertain ways or, or unfortunate ways. But in Scala, again, we have this concept of wrapping our types, wrapping our values in some kind of context where we denote that, hey, by the way, this is either, it might be on the left side a negative outcome of this, this function or on the right side a positive outcome. But the nice thing too here is that we're returning a value. We're not throwing an exception. And then the last kind of exercise here is just like we have two methods here, one that loads a person out of a database and one that loads a company out of a database. They both throw SQL exception, right? And we see this in this try catch block here. 
And if the, the, first for, the first method fails, we go into this catch block, we exit abnormally. If the second uh, get in the company fails, we exit abnormally. And then we, we go in this catch block and we have to do something with it. So how many people have written code like this? Okay, yeah, this is a safe place, right? <laughs> We're, okay, it's okay, you know, uh, where, where you might just return null uh, coming out of this, right? But it's unpredictable what's actually happening in here, right? But within Scala, we do the same thing with, again, these wrapper types. We're giving context to values and the fact that this could be a failure and forcing the person calling our function in order to deal with it. So I have here, like, I still have the same short-circuiting behavior just in the Scala way, right? If get person fails, you're going to return the failure, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna throw, right? If get company fails, we're gonna return that failure, and only if both of those succeed, by the way, will we actually return our employee as a successful result. So this is kind of short-circuiting behavior that you have we can emulate, but just using returns and not using throws. And then this is where you get into category theory, and then this is like, this is like the slippery slope, right? Uh, the gateway, if you will, uh, gateway drug of category theory, but you see flat map and immediately you know that this is a monad. Right? And, and these things come from category theory and the naming is unfortunate, right? Short circuiting might be better than monad and proceed if okay might be better than flat map, but we do have to deal with these terms, right? It's just important to know how these, mean, these things mean, what these mean. And once you start using monads, you get monad superpowers, <laughs> right? Where you get four comprehensions. And then these are a sequence of steps, and you know that they can exit, they can short circuit, right? It's very, very powerful. And, and this kind of wraps up the code portion of this, but like from a, an OO standpoint, I can relate to all these things, right? I can relate to them, they're less scary, right? And these, I believe, are by and large the fundamentals that you need to know before you start doing functional programming in Scala. So what's next? So the next thing is start coding. You know, I mean, I, I'm a practitioner, theory is great, but I like to build systems, right? So there's nothing better than actually building something with tools to, in order to learn how they're used, right? Um, and get, grow your knowledge organically. The, the, the neat thing today, where I, came, where I started, I think Play New was kind of the only thing out there. Today you have Gitterate templates. Uh, the precursor was activator templates. But I was able to, like, my first applications were Play Aka applications, but I was able to spin them up, I was able to new up a play application with like an actor backend, right? And I didn't need to know SBT, simple build tool, right? I didn't need to know anything about that. I didn't need to know how to define an endpoint in play or how to like connect that endpoint to an actor. I was able to get that out of the box and only when I needed to actually implement something different that I actually have to go out and research it and then hit a problem or implement something different and learn organically. Uh, so this kind of transitions, uh, I, I wanted to build an application a, a little, maybe about a year ago. I have a, an application built in Spray that I need to migrate. And there's this emerging type level stack. I don't know if everybody loves that term stack, but stack where you're HTTP for S, HTTP, Cersei for JSON, uh, Doobie for database access, and cats. And so like, I wanted to build an application using the stack. But there was no kind of template out there. Right? So I started assembling an application, but I did it in a setting that I'm familiar with, like OO people will be able to relate to, like myself and other developers. Right? Um, and I built it specifically, I built it, uh, to be honest with you, I wanted to get it out there, because I wanted people, functional programmers out there to give me feedback on it. And by the way, there's a bunch of people that have given me feedback, so thank you to those who have given me uh, ideas. Um, but the idea is I built an application using kind of this standard architecture. And this standard architecture comes out of Cockburn 2005, 2006, the hexagonal architecture, right? Um, and domain-driven design furthers this concept where you have a domain that's pure, right? It's simple and it's defined in terms of your business concepts and, 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 and validations and behavior, right? And then inevitably you have to get into your pure code so you have this bubble wrap around it. And then um, you, you push complexity to the edges. Right? So like, if you have a banking domain, you don't have to worry about, uh, it shouldn't be dealing with HTTP within your domain. Um, so if you look at the pet store structure, you can identify where all this code lives. Right? I, in the endpoint, I know HTTP things are in there. In the repository, I know that database things are in there. So I can start to relate to this as an OO guy. And so if we look at an endpoint, right, uh, Scala has this really powerful dependency injection framework built in. It's called argument passing. Right? So here we're doing function arguments um, and dependency injection, but I can deduce that this is a route, right? It's kind of fairly straightforward. And then I have 
a, a, a four comprehension here, so I know that it's a monad that's in, in, at work here, and then I'm taking the result of executing this create call and then mapping it into HTTP things. Okay. Um, and if we look at the service, we can see even a more complex example of dependency injection in Scala as construction parameters, right, or, con or constructor parameters. But here we can see monad, and we might not know what implicits are, but we know what monad gives us, okay? And we'll see either, and we'll go, okay, well, it's either T, but I know that that's kind of typically how we handle business errors. And then we'll, we'll convert to a business error, but this is a nice place to go, okay, what does either T give me? Right? So then you can go and look at monad transformers and you can look at either T, but you can read the concept in the documentation, but then you have a real world example that you can point back to and you can reference and go, okay, I can see how this materializes in my day-to-day -day life. Um, so the pet store repository is SQL and it's mostly SQL. Doobie is really awesome, right? So if you know SQL, you can write this code and you can work with Doobie and you can get up and running pretty quickly. So to, to wrap up, and this is the end of my talk, um, so by the way, this is me, this picture is pre-beer, <laughs> pre-beer, post-beer, okay. Uh, so for OO people, you know, avoid, you know, getting hooked on the category theory thing up front, right? Learn just the basics and start coding and learn, grow your knowledge organically. And for the functional programming community, I can't tell you when like free monad became a thing a couple years back, I was like, man, if somebody could just give me an example and an application I can understand, I'd be more readily to apply and adopt free monad in, in what I do day to day, right? So the power there for functional programming is that if you can give OO people an example that they can relate to, not only do you drive or accelerate adoption of those things, right, but you can accelerate and drive conversation and discussion, and that's really what it's all about, right? So there's my Twitter handle. There is the pet store. Uh, if, you, if you're from, coming from a functional program background, you think I'm doing something wrong, let me know. And if you're from an O background and you can't relate, let me know as well. Because what I'm looking to do is just drive this to a point where I can document it out and I'm not quite there yet. So that's it. In your day-to-day -day development, do you use cats regularly, and do you find that um, still an easy pattern to use, I guess, coming from an object-oriented background? Uh, with using implicits um, that cats give to you to uh, give you all the free money and stuff, um, I guess, and uh, just cat scenes, you can't compile and some of these. Um, there's, I don't know how widely the use pattern it, it, it is. So I'm wondering if you use that day to day. It's such a good question. So I came out of Akka and just more we're using the Scala framework and features and things like that. Um, and then evolved into using Scala Z disjunctions um, in terms of handling a lot of this stuff. Um, but we are evolving to cats. We don't use cats today, but one of the migrations that we're doing for one of our, uh, one of the applications that we work on is looking to use cats in order to do that. But you're right, you do get unfortunate squiggly lines in certain IDEs like IntelliJ. Um, but, you know, if, you know, and I think that once people see four comprehensions and they see things like Scala dis or disjunctions and the power they give you, I think that they're very uh, uh, amenable to coming on board and, and using them. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.